My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer. I'll do it, my friends. I'm just trying to make you a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate and to teach you. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. We were due for today's modest pullback. The S&P had been up eight straight days. Nine straight would have put us in rarefied territory. We haven't had that kind of winning streak since 2004. Of course, the session was rough. Dow off 62 points, S&P dipping 0.2%. NASDAQ losing 0.33%. But we got to wonder whether the market still has the horses to go higher. Because today, we got bad news. And guess what? Stocks actually went down that bad news. That's something that didn't happen much during the eight-day scheme. You see, we had very odd pattern going on during the winning streak. It was a bit of Pangloss and a nip of Camelot. When a company reported a good quarter better than expected, it Zoom. Buy, 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 buy. When a company reported it better than Fear Quarter, the stock more. When a company reported a bad quarter, we decided that was the last bad quarter because the Fed's about to cut rates. Buy, buy, so buy. it's no big deal. Go buy anyway. In other words, companies could do no wrong. But not today. Today, we had a bit of a reckoning, a dose of reality being thrown in our faces. Let's start with Lowe's, the home improvement chain we all know. The quarter was weaker than expected, but not by much. Management explained that there simply aren't enough housing transactions going on for them to make the numbers. As CEO Marvin Ellison said, I quote, people aren't moving nearly as often as they typically do because current mortgage rates are so much higher than their existing rates. Marv goes on to say, as a consequence, housing turnover is hovering near its lowest level since the mid-1990s. And the preference of spending on services, especially for the more affluent customer, consumer, well, has persisted much longer than expected, end quote. Lowe's also talked about weakness in big-ticket items. Homeowners are deferring their projects. They mentioned a great deal of uncertainty, particularly around interest rates and inflation. People who locked in lower rates before the Fed started tightening simply don't want to take out a new mortgage within much higher rates to say nothing of home equity loans, which is how you usually pay for these big ticket items. So Lowe's cut its same store sales forecast almost as much as Home Depot did a week ago. In fact, the quarter was practically a mirror image of Home Depot. Maybe better, though. When the Despot reported, though the stock dropped 15 points in pre-market trading, I took to X or Twitter or whatever and said that was ridiculous. You had to buy it. Sure enough, you just had to. Do you know it's now rallied 40 straight points from there, and it's only been a week? But Lowe's, Lowe's had a little bit better quarter, and the stock went down $3. And then, look, then it roared higher, but then it came right back. Uh, it, 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 look, it was kind of, it took me like a mini Home Depot. Plummeted, finished the day down, back three points. It was bad news. And bad news was bad news, and it took a lot of people by surprise. So if we step back, we have two companies, same business. One only goes up huge in a weak quarter, and one got hit on a similar set of numbers. What does that tell us? First, Home Depot reported a perfect moment when we felt that if you do well, you go higher, and if you do poorly, the Fed Fed capital will be there to save you. But seven days later, seven relentlessly positive days, we have to believe the stocks will no longer get the better for the Dow. We're too high. We're back to business as usual, where the good go up and the bad go down. The market's now sufficiently rich enough that we can't just say to the bears, heads I win, tails you lose. At these elevated levels, there's some rationality. And rationality is an anathema to the kind of move where everything can rally. Doesn't help that many expect the Fed cavalry to appear on Friday when they venture west to Jackson Hole. That's a lot of potential sellers if things don't go that way, their way. And I got to tell you, they will be sellers. It's a Friday, summer. In the end, Lowe's got hit because we may be dealing with a scenario where they need multiple rate cuts. And there's no sign of that. And, and they, they may not get enough to make it so their business turns around. Suddenly, the market's less forgive me. Suddenly, the market's asking questions like I just did. Here's another one that's like this. How about Boeing? This morning, we learned that Boeing discovered a structural problem in the 777X involving the engine's connection to the plane. Suboptimal. But for the last five months, Boeing's been a comedy of errors and it hasn't hurt the stock one bit. The thing just hangs in there, a function of its duopoly with Airbus. No matter what they do, Boeing stocks seem to be immune because Airbus and they are the only two that can make planes. Not today, though, Satan. Today, the news stuck and the stock dropped 4%, leaving us to wonder if aerospace has finally left Camelot. 
I think it's incredible that Boeing's been able to stay up for so long. It's a totally fraught situation, one you definitely don't want to wade into. Hey, look, if you're looking for aerospace, then go by RTX, which gives you the engine that hopefully stays attached to the plane, which is helpful. Let me give you another one. Estee Lauder reported an okay number, but then gave you a seminally horrendous forecast and an announcement that Fabrizio Freda would be retiring. They would have been fine if they had a new CEO lined up. Oh, no, but not this, these guys. Freda's going to stick around for another 10 months for whatever reason. And what happens, the stock spent most of the day in positive mode yesterday. We were selling for the Chapel Trust when it was going higher. We couldn't believe anyone was paying up for the stock. Today, same set of circumstances. What happens? The stock is just hammered. Finishes down 2%. Delayed reaction or just a different mindset? I think it's a different mindset. Where the market's no longer giving companies the benefit of the doubt, especially the ones like Estee Lauder, that didn't deserve the benefit of the doubt. Let's go healthcare. One of the most dramatic declines of this year came from Dexcom, an old favorite of ours, but we haven't talked to them in a long time. It's the make of blood sugar monitors for people with diabetes. In the last week of July, the stock fell from 111 to 64 in one of the most brutally missed quarters I have come across. Since then, though, Dexcom's been creeping back up. It's getting all the way going step by step, inch by inch to $77 last night. And then, bam, Eli Lilly releases a three-year study on its revolutionary GLP-1 drug, and we learn it can prevent 94% of at-risk patients from developing type 2 diabetes. I don't want to take away anything away from Lily's achievement. And I'll talk about that later, especially since it's such a big winner for the Chapel Trust. But these results were basically in line with every other window that the drug's been measured against. This time, though, Dexcom got clocked down 6%. Because obviously the GLP ones, they're bad for the diabetes monitoring business. And today we cared about it. Finally, one other thing to worry about, we had the wrong stocks go higher. We've had a broad market, but today it was narrow. The Staples, Procter & Gamble, Colgate, Clorox, and the like, they were all on fire. Now, some of that's because the dollar's gotten much weaker, and these companies tend to sell a great deal overseas, although that's not really the case with Clorox. But when you see the kind of strength in the recession proof stocks, it's a sign that Wall Street's maybe expecting at least some cohort. Not good news from the Fed on Friday, and therefore a slowdown. A bad slowdown. Now, the good news is that these are all subtle. There was no head bashing here. There, we're not having one of those roaring openings and then a pirouette down that takes your breath away and causes people to run for the hills. Get out now. I don't see the recklessness and the greed that abound at the top. But the bottom line, we're getting back to reality. We're good is good, bad is bad. Never the twain shall meet. In short, the market's rational again. But maybe that's the point. The eight days up, they were the out, were given, the outliers just were given some weakness and so much of the macro data and that excessively, endlessly forgiving exuberance. Well, maybe they do have to be tempered, like today, before we can mount another rally. Let's go to Trey in Texas. Trey! Jim, I was halfway through a Mexican pizza last night when I realized I've once again failed my diet plan. But you taught me to look for opportunity in everything. So I developed an algorithm from which I seek to identify earnings beats for restaurants by tracking my weight daily throughout each quarter. Needless to say, Jim, Q3 looks like a huge beat for young brands. Would you agree? Well, I think that you ought to test your luck with Darden with the never-ending pasta bowl that just came back. I think that Darden's better than Yum because I tell you the truth, you need to get no Mexican pizza at the, at the Pizza Hut, which, by the way, has pizza that I frankly reminds me of the pizza when Pat Doyle started at Domino's, you remember the kind that was a little more like shirt cardboard? What can you do? Let's go to Eric in Florida, please. Eric. Oh, yeah, Jim. Long time Sorry. listener, first time caller. Thanks so much for having me on. We tonight. need some new blood. We have been hey. getting some, a lot of the same people from Illinois. You know, we get a lot of people. That, we, get, can you give me some new blood like this fella? Thank you. Hey, thank you, Jim. I just spent so much money, so much money at Disney over the past weekend. The stock is at a 10-year low. Is it a buy? What do you think? Didn't he? Yeah. I think it is. I wanted to buy some today. I wanted to buy some yesterday. Jeff Marks and I have been going hammer and tongs about this. He doesn't seem to want to pull the trigger. Reminds me that we're very overbought. But I'll tell you one thing. Disney's not overbought. Disney's horrendous. Maybe that's why you should buy it. Today's market was, well, well, didn't fit today's template, where good news is good news and bad news, like we've been getting from Disney, is bad news. In short, maybe the market's getting rational again, which you actually need to sustain a higher advance. Man, money tonight. Could an investment in sweet green help your portfolio make some green? I'm slicing and dicing into the company while I also have some Mexican pizza. Then we're taking technicals with the charters who predicted the pullback in high-flying tech stocks this spring. 
No, you don't want to see it. And it has to do also with a stock that's going to report next week that you may have heard of. And uh, you were, uh, but you got some confusion maybe over Confluent? After putting a month ago, the stock dropped 17% in a single day. Today, I'm getting a read on potential turnaround, potential turnaround, emphasis on the word potential, with the company CEO. And I want you to stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.